the side by sides and a lot, almost every strain except for one. In side by side tests, they come up higher in CBD when you give them those wide variety of aquatic microbes, even though they are bacterial dominant. So um, that this doesn't necessarily mean that like it, it's um, uh, directly against what they were talking about earlier. Is that it's entirely different food web. They're two separate creatures, and you can combine them to get even better growth, especially if you're doing clone production, mother production. And if you're doing a nursery license, you can get you know growth well beyond what you could possibly get ever with soil in terms of speed, uh, with equally as low inputs. And we're going to talk all about that kind of science. So, how many people here today are the aquaponics groups? Normally, everybody's like aqua what? <laughs> Um, one of the biggest differences when you're looking at aquaponics versus hydroponics is thinking about it with hydroponics, we're always looking at total EC or total PPM, where we're going to clean. Well, um, you can get the exact same results with you know, an eighth the levels or a tenth of those PPM levels by having much more microbial activity. And then you can take some of the work like with, with Chris does with KNF and combine that to get even better mineralization. Uh, and not only that, but increase fish growth. Um, I've, uh, I'm working very closely with the University of Kentucky State. We're actually going to talk about that a little bit later in this, in this, in this, in this slide deck. But they actually did a study last year. And got, not only did they get over t almost 20% increased growth in their plants with hemp at, at, down at University of Kentucky State, adding just lack of bacillus with their, their systems, they also got 15% faster fish growth. So that just shows you know, when you start to increase the, the, the total food web of the system, not only will your plants grow better, everything in the system will go better. And especially if you're trying to make a permaculture property or really get the most out of your business, reduce your overhead as much as possible, especially in colder climates, and have some extra income sources, you know, aquaponic production might be a great option, or at the very least for your veg or for your clone production if you're doing a large you know, soil farm, this could be a great way to crank out you know, a ton of well, you know, well quality controlled production plants for the rest of your farm, even if you don't want to adapt it to the rest of your system. So we're going to talk a lot about that, and we're going to talk a little bit about climate control. There's a lot of awesome climate control methods because of the extra thermal mass we have with all the water in the system that we can use, especially in places like here in Canada. It works amazingly well, especially if you get out towards the plains, out towards Alberta and Ontario. You know, you have a lot more sun than you guys do here on the coast, and it can really, really cut down your, your climate control costs dramatically. I did a front range greenhouse, 50 by 30 by 18 greenhouse with 87 pounds of propane for the whole winter, which is insane. You know, anyone here that's, that's run that big of a greenhouse knows that's, that's psychotic. So, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just, what, two barbecue things, three barbecue things for a whole winter? That's unreal, you know what I mean? So we're going to talk all about that. So, go ahead. So what is aquaponics? Well, for those of you that aren't familiar with aquaponics, aquaponics is using fish and fish waste, or shrimp, you know, uh, they're another great source. Um, there's other aquatic animals. Uh, I know there's in southern Colorado, there's a guy, a guy has a big alligator farm and they use the alligator waste to raise vegetables to feed the chickens to feed the alligators. So um, you can even get closed loops if you want to raise alligators So um, <laughs> with aquaponics. <laughs> so um, but basically, uh, primarily what traditionally people will tell you is you have uh, nitrosoma, will, will convert, convert your nitro, uh, ammonia to nitrate and then nitrospira. Maybe I might have said that backwards. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then that other one converts it to nitrate. Well, as we talked about earlier, the plants will actually utilize nitrate first along with a little bit of ammonium, which is exactly what the fish will provide. Now, you don't always want that, especially in the flower, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but um, that's what everyone will tell you. Well, there's also those same type of microbial chains that have to mature in your system or be introduced for phosphorus and silica and calcium and iron and those same kind of pathways and webs that feed each other. And what's really cool is that none of them are the same, and we're going to get to a, a really awesome study that was done a little bit later in the slide deck on how biodiverse, you know, with, with soil, that you guys all have fairly similar players and fairly similar roles, you know, not just, you know, exactly, but in general, they're very similar. In aquatics, it's all over the place, which is really interesting. And I have some really cool side by sides I'm going to show about how that plays out in the, in the plant growth. Um, but basically, the, the plants then absorb whatever nutrients, like nitrates and other things that would traditionally be toxic to them, and, and reabsorb them back out, filtering the water and allowing that water to be reusable again. Okay. So traditionally, for cannabis growing, at least uh, since that's what we're talking about mainly today, we like to use media beds, uh, media or flood and drain beds. You can do flood and drain tables, any of those things will work. I prefer to use media beds and have media even in with the system, even with the plants, rather than just straight microbes are going to die. And, and I'm going to walk away from the mic here. So you have your bell siphon, and for those of you guys that don't know, does anyone know who invented the very first bell siphon? Australian, right? Nope, way older. 
Pythagoras. Pythagoras oh. invented the very first bell siphon, but it was actually a clay cup. And it had a bell siphon built into the center of it. And if someone poured too much wine, it would dump all the wine out of the cup straight, you know, all over their front of them or their shoes or whatever. And it's called a greed cup or a greedy cup. Uh, yeah, that's the very first bell siphon. That's where the technology comes from. Um, but how it works is uh, uh, this bell goes over top of this. And as the water comes up, it creates a vacuum where the air can then evacuate out and then what happens is the water creates a seal, which creates a plug, which, which then the gravity pulls down, and it creates a vacuum. And it drains all the water down until it hits these slits here. And that allows air to get in, break the vacuum, and immediately stop the flood and drain process. So I can run one pump continuously with a whole bunch of grow beds, and this will flood and drain automatically all on its own without any additional pumps or timers. And timers will fail way before your pumps will, usually. Um, especially if you got proper pre-filtration. So uh, I try to avoid timers whenever possible and just cause issues. Uh, index valves can be another great solution uh, if you're trying to go for a flood and drain type situation for really large setups. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions on bell siphons? They're one of the better ways to do you know, beds. Up to uh, the largest ones you can comfortably do with a one inch drain setup is about a, a 12 by four foot bed. Um, you know, you wanna make them no larger than that for flood and drain. Um, after that, you want to consider maybe going to an inch and a half for your flood and drain, but you will have to go with a faster flow rate. Steve, talk about the angles underneath. Oh, sure. So one of the main things that people do, people get real frustrated with bell siphons. Um, if you don't have two 90 degree turns like this, you don't get the proper water flow that creates that proper vacuum. And, and what will happen is it'll either uh, constantly flow over and never break, or it will, um, if your water flow is too high, it'll, the water will be down at the bottom and it won't actually ever refill the bed. It just keeps flowing up and through. Um, but if you don't have these two elbows here, it will absolutely, um, uh, you know, prevent you from it. The other mistake people do is they'll run a straight pipe here straight into the water so it's quiet. Well, how's the air supposed to get back in to break it? You, you can't. So what you can do is put a, a piece of pipe down and put horizontal slits in it and so it'll work like a silencer. It'll guide the water down, quiet the pump, or quiet it if it's in a, in a room where you're going to be in all the time, and still allow that air to get back in. But that is very important. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, here's a little example of a super simple system. You know, you can just put a, you know, you put your elbow in there. I gotta change that graphic a little bit, but um, um, that's you know, it's not that much more complicated than that. You can also do DWC and wicking beds. I would DWC doesn't really work with aquaponics, at least not that I found at all. Um, I've even I, I did a bunch of work with um, uh, uh, Green Relief Incorporated, and the only reason why they're doing that is because they're adapting their current systems that they'd already purchased and had to adapt their. Um, you know, if you're ideally going to set that up, you would set them up in a flood and drain. You get a much better gas exchange and accelerated growth, uh, and a lot more control over the system. Than if you're going to do DWC. I've worked with a couple of other people. If you guys might know um, Friendly Aquaponics out in uh, Hawaii, uh, they were some of the first to grow aquaponics. Do you guys know why they talk so much about not growing cannabis now? It's part of their DEA plea deal. If you go in and you look up in the public record, they're actually supposed to discourage others from growing cannabis aquaponically. Um, and they put out a lot of disinformation. They actually put out three hit, piece, three hit pieces on me and stood up at, a, at one of the aquaponic conferences and told, basically called me the devil for supporting aquaponic cannabis production. So that's where a lot of the misinformation for aquaponics in general with cannabis production actually came from originally had nothing to do with the science. And they were doing DWC and feeding it the same nutrients as lettuce. And everybody in this room knows if I feed cannabis the nutrients that I need for lettuce, it's just not going to work. It's certainly not going to give you good flour. So um, people just didn't understand the chemistry. They just they were so stuck on the religion of aquaponics where you feed the fish. And just a lot of people in the industry that today feed the fish and the plants grow. Well, there's more science to that. And um, especially with things like, uh, I did a lot of research with silica. Silica makes a night and day difference in the shelf stability of lettuce and aquaponics. Um, I used to run the research and development laboratory over the aquaponics source. We had a whole research and development lab along with two greenhouses, and we could do all the R&D we wanted. The greenhouses ended up becoming greenhouse, uh, cannabis research and development. Um, and I got some pictures of that with, uh, a little bit later in the deck. But um, if you guys have any questions on any kind of weird nutrient question or, or crop question or plant question with aquaponics, you know, if I don't know the answer, I definitely know who the right person to send you and you know, give you the email for. On the next slide. So what are the different components of a, of a normal aquaponic system? So you have your aquariums there on the bottom, so those are big round fish tanks. Um, that's what we traditionally use. Um, up top we have a sump tank, uh, that's what we usually use underground, the big giant round ones, usually 2,000 gallon sumps most of the time. 
Um, you got your media beds, you know, they could be prefab or with a liner. You know, if you're going to do commercial scale, you're going to build your own beds with, and put, a, put your own liner, it's a lot cheaper. And then you got your media, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, but that's where most of the majority of your microbes is. All your soil food web microbes, that's where they're going to have, uh, you know, habitate in, in this type of system. Uh, and then the bottom right here, we have a cone tank. Now these we use for solid separation. Um, we turn them into radial flow filters and we use them to separate the fish waste so that we can mineralize it and turn it into hyper mineral rich water that we can then add back to the, uh, the, the system uh, as an offline filtration system. And it works extremely well. Um, it gives you the best control. You can you know, change up the microbes. We do a lot of microbial additives. We do a lot of KNF additives into our mineralization tanks to really help unlock the maximum potential of that fish waste and get the most out of it so that we don't have to use you know hardly any inputs. We're losing 15 we're only using 15 to 30 percent supplemental nutrients now compared to most soil growers uh, in terms of supplemental nutrients. Not, not you guys, you guys all do regenerative, but you know most of our competitors out there on the market. Um, um, thanks a lot. Um, so this is a nice little small system if you're just looking to grow two plants. You can build us a tough tote and a concrete mixing tray, you know, from Home Depot. If you want to get your feet wet and just grow a couple clones, grow a mom or something, this whole system costs fifty dollars. Uh, I used to do them all the time as a workshop uh, for people that just didn't have a lot of money and wanted to have a nice little apartment grow. Uh, I've been teaching people how to make these for almost ten years, um, so they're a great little system. You know, cost fifty bucks. You know, anybody can afford one of those. So if anybody has any questions on that or does any school projects or anything, I got a bunch of stuff I can I can put you in touch with. Uh, I also do a lot of work with schools. I did a bunch of work with down in LA and, and as well as uh, Colorado with, with a couple of different school districts teaching aquaponics as well. So aside from the cannabis stuff, I also like teaching the kiddos now and then. They listen to me more. They're like, uh, I, three or four times, they're like, can you grow cannabis with aquaponics? And I'm like, no, but if you look online, there's definitely not a podcast on that. <laughs> so next slide. So here's an example of a more of a backyard system. This is like a you know one you could drop to run down to hydro uh, you know any of your local hydro stores and grab the grow beds and build a you know a quick fish tank. Um, just a couple of grow beds, a couple of um, uh, sump tanks. You know the sump tanks here. This is a great slide for explaining the chemistry. So you want to make sure that the water volume in your sump tanks is enough to hold the water volume of your grow beds plus. 30% because you want to make sure you don't burn up your pumps if all these beds decide to flood all at the same time which over the course of a month or two eventually it's going to happen you want to make sure that you don't over fry your pump now with this type of setup we'll put bridge siphons on all of them and put one central pump so it'll constantly balance the water between the three of those um, but um, if you're going to do this in your backyard and you're in a colder climate you would dig out a pond underneath and put a platform and then do it that way so you get the extra thermal mass which we'll talk about in the climate control but um, kind of gives you a basic layout. How much, you know, it's only like a, I think it's a 14 by 14 greenhouse or 18 by 18, something like that. So Now this is a commercial scale one. This is some of the design work I've done for, for more, you know, Jamaica or third world style countries where we're just using water tanks and 55 gallon drums and flow, um, uh, grow beds with index valves. And how this works is we have an index valve here. So this will flood um, the fish tanks constantly circulating this way. Same thing with the sump here. And then the sump will circulate from here and it'll flood what this row and then it'll drain back down. It'll flood this row for 15 minutes and drain back down. So over the course of an hour, each one of these is getting 15 minutes and then 45 minutes of, of dry. Um, this gives you really, really good coverage and we can use as little water as possible, especially in places like I did a lot of work in Jamaica they don't have that much water year round. They get whatever they get in the rainy season, they tank it all up and that's it. Like if I got a buddy in Barbados, that's if he doesn't get a lot of rain, he's screwed. So he has to be very, very, very conservative. So by doing this, I can use as little iron supplemental as possible because I have much less water volume, which means I'm gonna get must lose a lot less to oxidation uh, per application. Even though I'm gonna use the same amount of iron to actually feed the plants, I'm gonna lose less in the oxidation process because it's less water volume. And I can get by even in very arid environments without you know using that much water. You gotta you know always think about over you know especially if you're in Humboldt or something. They're squeezing the crap out of you guys on the water restrictions. And with you know at least doing even your veg in this, and you can cut a lot of gallons per day off of your your production, and bring it back down into your you know whatever your regulation you need to meet, which is becoming harder and harder, especially in a lot of state you know more progressive states. 
I would, certainly not in some of the newer ones. Some of the stuff I'm hearing out of Oklahoma and Tennessee and Missouri makes me want to pull my hair out. Um, <laughs> next slide. Um, here's a more uh, professional grow. I have design. So you got your two greenhouses here. You got your nursery over here. You got your changing room. All the employees have to go through so that no one's wearing any insect covered uh, things. And then you got your public area where the public can view the fish tanks and then you know a clear wall where they can see the whole grow. So that one's going up in Oklahoma right now. So let's give you a couple different design layouts. Um, and if anyone has any questions, needs any help with design on the box, that's what I do. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much on that, but um, you know, feel free to reach out. I also have a podcast called Growing with Fishes. If you're interested, check that out as well, um, where uh, Josh is on there every week and uh, try to promote regenerative soil and aquaponic production uh, and organic hydroponic production and you know, just general sustainable uh, production. So, next slide. So here's a uh, list of all the different nutrients uh, that your fish, your biofilter, your microbes, and your plants need. And you can kind of see they're different, using them in different amounts. Um, this was based study is a little bit old, it's based on 2005. They've done a lot more nutrient work since then. But just gives you an idea on how not everything in the system needs every single nutrient in a you know, hyper bioavailable form. Um, and this gets much more important when we start to talk about the two separate zones of, uh, of growing in aquaponics. Uh, next slide. So why would you want to go on aquaponics? Well, traditionally to date, you found it's about 18% plus minus uh, percent of the water of traditional drain to waste or, or outdoor soil grow. Um, we use about 15 to 30% of our supplemental nutrients. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, you also get fish, fish waste, compost, tea, soil, and ferments that you can also that you're constantly making in order to keep the system, you know, at maximum um, uh, virility and maximum production. And um, that really gives you lots of side income. So that helps pay for the electricity or pay for you know, whatever else you have that month. That Those are incomes that you're simply not gonna get if you're doing soil. We actually generate more soil with an aquaponic system than we actually use for the year, even if we're, we're turning that back in. Because of the fish waste at the end of the remineralization process, we still end up with some solids that we then compost at the end. So we actually generate on a uh, 12,000 square foot row, we'll generate almost two tons of soil a, a year, which is insane. <laughs> and that's just by feeding that leftover heavy mist that doesn't want to mineralize real quickly to our worm bins. And they just break it down. We get tons of awesome worm juice and, and worm casings out of that that we can then add back to our mineralization tanks and keep the whole system, you know, cranking and make sure all of our microbial levels are constantly, you know, where they want to be. Um, so uh, we've also increased terpene profile, terpene profile in almost all of our almost all of our um, tests so far, as well as CBD, and almost every single strain except for one was higher than the soil control with, with same inputs. Also much faster in veg, we can get incredible, incredible growth in veg. I've been growing in soil because I've been traveling quite a bit lately. So I got a small little soil grow where I'm staying at temporarily. It's like watching paint dry compared to how fast they grow in aquaponics. It's such a night and day difference. Yeah. So uh, we've done a, a, we're currently working on a study this year with the University of Kentucky State on the cannabinoid and ter uh, terpene profile differences. I'm um, helping co-author that down there with a, a girl named Rose on the University of Kentucky State. I was formerly working with Joe Pate down there. Uh, he's a really, really awesome guy. I think he's uh, really into George Pate. Um, he's currently working over in Colorado. But um, he actually did a really awesome study with lactobacillus ferment, which I was talking about earlier on the, with the, making the fish go faster as well. Uh, we've also noticed that it increases total terpene levels across the board. Um, it does increase mercine quite a bit, which I know isn't always desirable, um, but um, uh, not in every strain. We found another strain that's increasing, you know, dramatically increasing other terpenes, and we think as well, we keep experimenting with, with that a little bit more, and especially with um, a little bit more biodiversity with the aquatic layer, we can really crank out certain terpenes, and we've really seen huge differences in side-by-sides with, with the terpene profiles, and, uh, uh, particularly with certain um, uh, terpenes. If anyone wants to shoot me an email on that, I can give you the exact ones that we're talking about. But if I got into that, we'd be, I'd be half the talk. Um, <laughs> um, so there's lots of different aquaponics farms now. I have a, a mul multiple in Oklahoma. I have one up here in Canada, and I have one down in Colorado. We're all aggregating all of our data. So in another year or two, we'll have a, a lot better picture of how that aquatic food web will really change the, the profiles. Um, like, just like some of the other work that other people here in the, are doing with the soil profiles, be real interesting to see, you know, and doing that along with um, bio, um, uh, what's the name of it? Uh, bio, um, when they test all the different microbes in the system, uh, I can't think of the name of it. 
Yeah, bio, yeah, bio, was it bio survey? That, that one, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so that'll be really interesting. So we, um, next slide, sorry. There's a couple of things I keep wanting to talk about, but I have slides on them. Um, so the, what are the roles of the fish? So the fish uh, will respirate and produce ammonia and CO2 in the water. CO2 is not a desirable effect, um, which is part of the reason why you want lots of aeration uh, in your filtration between your solid separators and uh, when, you're, when it goes uh, back to the bed. So if it goes to the sumps, you want to make sure you have extra aeration in there to off-gas that additional CO2 buildup uh, that can happen, especially if you're doing really high-density aquarium produ uh, fish production. Um, it can definitely become an issue where you're putting a little bit too much CO2 in. Um, and, and the inverse is also possible. I was actually out at a farm uh, last year and they actually had uh, over aeration in their uh, DWC beds that were growing lettuce and they were over aerating it and holding their uh, pH at 7.5 or stay at 7.5 or go up because they were injecting so much air they were, they were raising the pH which was really crazy. As soon as we shut that extra aeration off, water went right back down to 6.6 .6, right where it was supposed to be. So. All kinds of crazy stuff when you, when you start running into all these aquaponic guys. They find all kinds of weird ways to, to mess up systems. <laughs> um, I've had people put window cleaner in their system to kill aphids. I've had people put OxyClean in it because it was oxygen, so it would be fine with the fish. Uh, I've had people legitimately ask me if they could pleasure themselves into the system to feed their baby fish. Um, all <laughs> kinds of stuff. You would, like, this is craziest, craziest stuff. I've had people email me or ask me. It's just stupid. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> um, so um, the fish provide ammonia, which then gets converted into nitrate eventually by the nitri um, uh, nitrification process. Um, the fish also can produce uh, lots of other things. So if I'm going to try and balance the system a lot better, if I'm going to do traditional cannabis, you know, normal cannabis production, I'm going to do much more herbivores in my flowering system because they're going to produce a lot more phosphorus rich, uh, uh, which you want a little bit more phosphorus in the flower and a lot less nitrogen, which is the main reason. Then I would if I'm going to do, say, in veg. In veg, I want to feed proteins. So I'm going to put carnivores. I want trout or perch or tilapia, something that's going to want a higher protein. Or I'm um, working with a guy in right now in India, and we're going to be raising snakeheads or murel, um, which is you know the highest, you know, one of the better prices for fish. But they're super high protein. You know, any any carnivore is going to give you a lot better for veg, or as your or a, you know a balance thereof for for flour. Um, so you know veggie, you know herbivores for for flour, or, you know carnivores for veg. And it's very generalizing. You know, I'm not to say you can't use with the other one or the other. It's just a good you know if you're trying to get a simple you know quick guide on what's better for one or the other. There you go. Um, so then, uh, higher protein requirements again, higher nitrogen, we just talked about that, herbivores. Um, okay, we're good. Um, so fish species, so um, the best fish species that you guys should do if you're going to get started with this is koi. Um, koi are the most bulletproof, um, they're really hard to kill. Um, you can, you can, I've seen people overdose all kinds of different nutrients and watch them survive as long as you do a pretty quick water change. Um, and again, they have a really good turnaround price. If you get butterfly koi, you can buy them at one or two bucks a piece and turn them around for you know twenty to forty dollars a piece one to two years later. That is way better than you'd ever do with a tilapia. You're going to get what six, eight bucks of uh, tilapia for a whole fish versus twenty to forty. It's a way better thing. Plus, they're more bulletproof. So if your guys are just getting, you know you have helpers, they're a lot harder to kill. So it's a way better at least for your first year. Go with that. The other problem is. There, there is no meat processor right now that will certify a farm that has cannabis on it. I can't find one. I've tried for multiple customers. They won't do it. They're all freaked out. They're, they're regulatory. They don't want to touch it. So you can't get someone that will let you kill and process those fish on the same property that will certify, at least in the United States right now, that will certify that. So you're far better off, and it's way cheaper to go with a pet trade license and then hawk your fish off to the pet trade. In most states, it's 150 bucks or less. So it's way more cost effective to go that route. Um, tilapia are a great one if you're gonna do food fish. Paku would probably be my other good one, and yellow perch, those would probably be my, my best ones. Um, catfish can be a little bit more sensitive. Um, if you wanna get into exotics, arapanema and arowanas are also really good ones that will tolerate the nutrient conditions you would for cannabis. Um, they get much dollar, higher price per dollar, but you will need much larger tanks. Um, and then you got bluegills and sunfish, they're, they're native, you can get a decent price for those. Um, you can also, one of the other groups, there's a cannabis aquaponics uh, uh, grow out in California that's raising sturgeon. And they actually got the state 
to get them to raise the surgeon up and um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you have species or you can mix species? Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk, let me finish the surgeon point and then I'll, I'll talk on that. Um, so they actually got the state um, a contract to raise the sturgeon. They get the sturgeon fry from the state, raise them for two years, and they release them into the wild. But the state's paying for their nutrient production. So if you can find a gig, gig like that with aquaponics, that's not an opportunity you'd ever get with soil. No one's going to get you, can you raise me soil microbes so that I can you know, re-release them into the wild and we'll pay for them? The state will never do that, but you can do that with fish. You know what I mean? So if you're, if you're low on, if it is an option for you and something to think, you know, think outside the box as a way for funding. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to put soil stuff down. I'm just saying like, there is no kind of equal thing that, you know, maybe you can find like a woodchuck or something. I don't know, like groundhog or chipmunk or, I don't know. I don't know how you make it work with your plants though. Um, <laughs> but um, I've also had a friend of mine, um, I haven't had a chance to do it because it's pretty tricky. Uh, I would not recommend doing shrimp with cannabis. Because they specifically, if you end up overdosing anything, you're going to kill them instantly. They're super, super sensitive to potassium. Um, also avoid, for, uh, for growing cannabis, especially in flowering systems, avoid anything that goes into salt water. Um, uh, a barramundi, um, salmonids, um, anything that would transition or can transition to salt water tend to be much, much more sensitive to potassium. Uh, striped bass would be another one. Avoid those because any, you know, potassium gets too high, you're going to lose all of them and you're gonna really, really be upset. Um, the other ones, so you talked about diversity earlier, so I like to have a couple of plecos, if, especially in, in cannabis tanks where the water's warmer. You can get exotic plecos, super cheap, that will be sell for two to three hundred dollars after one to two years of growth as well. And they can be another great side income where you can get a, you know, a few grand, a 10 to 20 grand a year, uh, and this starts to stack up. You know, we're talking a lot of different ones that we've decoupled. You want to raise cold butter fish, salmonids, or something else, and decouple it, which is the only time I'd recommend decoupling, is the temperature difference. You can run Chinese high spin algae sharks, or if you're going to run in a, in, a, in a climate where you end up run different temperatures from summertime to wintertime, maybe up here in Canada, Chinese high spin algae sharks will tolerate the same temperatures that koi will, and they love to eat hair algae, which is the enemy of anyone that's ever grown in a koi pond or anything outside. That stuff clogs up all your stuff, and it, that is their absolute favorite food. It's like candy to them. They will plow one, one you know, decent sized fish can clear a, a you know, 5,000, 10,000 gallon pond in, in a week or two. It's really amazing. They're just huge pigs on the stuff. They love it. But it's one of the best natural controls. Um, Which one you, was that? A Chinese hyphen algae shark. Yep. They also call them pond sharks. That's another common name for them. Um, and then uh, also like catfish, so putting in two or three catfish in the bottom, if any food hits the bottom, they kind of keep the bottom clean. Um, they also cruise around the bottom, so they're keeping that fish waste that's on the bottom, keeping it kicked up into the water column so it ends up back in the filtration. And just by putting two or three of them in or four of them in that are similar size to the rest of your stockfish, just keeps the system clean. If, if you get a fish that dies, most of the time they'll eat it, or two or three of them will pick it apart and they'll clean it well before it ever gets a chance to become, you know, decay and become anaerobic. I'm kind of getting I don't know if you're going to touch on this at some point, but we have a 400,000 gallon irrigation pond that's lined. And is there a fish that you would recommend that would work for that? Kind of give us some benefit, but not for a recirculation point. Uh, that's going to hang out on the bottom? Just in general. Oh, just in general? Yeah. Koi are really good for that, just for cruising and keeping the thing going. Um, they like to, they don't really hang out in one spot all day. They like to really move around. Um, so they're, they're a great option. Um, what, where's your, where do you live, you up here? Southern Humble. Southern Humble, yep, koi would be a really good option. Uh, yellow perch, yellow perch really cruise around, but they're not gonna be near the bottom much, so if that's what you're looking for. You know, just a couple of channel cats and some yellow perch would be great, especially if you can catch them both of them on the rod and reel eventually, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My neighbor's always good trout. trout. Trout are, can be difficult in aquaponics, and traditionally most of your trout are 60 degrees or colder, which is way too cold for most of our reservoirs. Yeah, anyone that's ever run hydro knows it's way too cold for what we want to run in reservoirs. Traditionally, we don't ever want to run colder than about 68 with aquaponics, with, with cannabis, to get proper growth. You know, 68, 70 is kind of where you want to sit. Um, next slide. Oh, I'll go back one second. So this is one of the exotic plecos I was talking about. And then these are little shrimps. If you're ever doing vegetables, I just threw these in here real quick. If you're doing lettuce and you got wraps, put these guys underneath your wraps. You can make one to 80 bucks a piece on those guys, depending on the grade. And um, aside from that, they, you can raise them in the thousands. You don't have to do anything. You just eat algae and detritus in the system, and they're a great side income if you ever use vegetable production. Okay. 
So fish foods. So there's lots of different fish foods. So if you're going to do more herbivore stuff, you got broccoli, nori, romaine, um, and peas. Uh, especially if you got fish that's getting um, like uh, you ever have a fish that eats too close to the surface and it's floating and it's having a heart buoyancy issues. Give it some peas or spirulina. It'll help clear the gut out. Um, nine times out of ten, it helps work. Or you give them a salt dip. It also works extremely well. And then you got um, uh, insects and roaches, soldier fly larvae, crickets and worms. So I'm a big fan of um, dubia and hissing cockroaches. They're one of the best, uh, fastest breeding uh, protein and fat rich sources for not only your fish, but also your chickens and anything else that you have They use protein. You can get a top loading freezer, put some heat tape in it, put, uh, and then put a two inch band of Vaseline on the top and they won't cross it. You put your cut pieces of PVC in there and make them easy to harvest. You pull them out, bang them out into a Ziploc bag, zip it up, throw it in your freezer for half an hour so they're all dead and they're not running around your greenhouse because nobody wants that, <laughs> just in case you miss the fish tank or something. And, um, and then you, well, they're all dead then. And then you dump them in your fish tank or you feed them to your chickens or whatever, you know? And it's just a great, really cheap resource. You can take any leftover leaves or roots or, you know, whatever plant material you have from pruning from the day and feed it back to them and really get a lot more back out of it and cut your overhead down. And also, because you're feeding much higher, uh, they're really good fat to protein ratio, so it really gives you accelerated fish growth rates as well. Um, so it's a really great source. So when I was in Jamaica, we used mango roaches and spirulina as our only two fish foods, and it worked really well. Um, black worms would be another one I want to suggest, especially if you're doing uh, any type of wet, if you have even drainage, wetter drainage areas of your property. Um, you can introduce black worms and then dig into those anaerobic zones and bust them up. They love to feed on the bacteria that live in those areas. So they'll get in there and, and tunnel through them and get oxygen in there and, and make that, you know, get rid of that sludgy, nasty area that can cause a lot of those problems. And, and you know, if you have an anaerobic area in a, in a, a closed loop aquaponic system, it'll start to flip your pH and your pH will start to go up. And that's when you know you have too many anaerobic zones. A really good indication you have too many anaerobic zones. And the system's constantly been going down in pH. And all of a sudden it's going up. You've been, you got something's wrong with your filtration. You're getting too much waste buildup in there. Um, you can also solve that with using lactobacillus. That'll chew right through a lot of that um, and help you kind of keep your system a lot cleaner, but we'll talk a little bit later about that in, in, in the deck. Um, uh, frozen foods can be good, pelletized foods, uh, worms. I raise a lot of worms with most of the growers that we're working with. And then garlic. Garlic's a great one if fish are injured, uh, just came in, they're stressed out. Um, if you're raising exotics and um, they're wild caught, it can also help clean out intestinal parasites. It's a great, great thing. Um, a little bit of garlic, um, uh, garlic extract on their food and a little bit of water just to soak it in, where it's a great way to treat sick fish. So the role of plants in aquaponics. So this is just a little clone. You can see I just popped it in there. Huge set of roots after uh, you know just three weeks. Um, it might have been four. I forget on that one. Uh, but um, so the role of plants is to serve the filtration for your plants um, or filtration for the water. I'm sorry. Um, the plants uh, do not acquire the taste of fish. Have, people ask me that all the time. If the plants have any fishy taste? No. Fish don't put out terpenes or anything. So. It's not going to assimilate anything to, to taste fishy. Um, and then again, we're going to get by with 70 to 90% less nutrients than, than most of other methods. And most of that's coming from the fish waste. It's not that we're not getting inputs, it's just that that input's coming from all that, that fish manure. Uh, or, and then the, you know, the, the whole food web, the aquatic food web that comes from that after the fact. You know, the same way that you have you know, uh, all the soil food web, you have the aquatic food web. When you marry them together, you get in my opinion, the maximum plant growth that's possible, at least that I've personally seen in terms of growth per day. Uh, and we're going to show that in a minute. Um, so, um, uh, again, as much as 50% faster than soil. Yeah. So, uh, the aquaponic soil biodiversity versus uh, aquaponic versus soil biodiversity. Um, this was a study done in 2017 um, by, the, by the USDA. And they actually went around and did uh, microbial studies where they took um, samples from a whole bunch of soil places, a whole bunch of aquaponic places, and a whole bunch of aquaculture places. And um, the most biodiverse was the aquaponic systems. The second most biodiverse were the aquatic hydroponic system, or organic hydroponic systems. The third most biodiverse was the soil in terms of total number of biodiversity in the system. Um, the closest um, um, system for soil compared to aquaponics, the aquaponics system is 167% more biodiverse. So it's really insane when you start to look at the sheer amount of microbial biodiversity and what the potential is and how it's, it's so much even more larger than what is available in soil and we know nothing about it. Nobody's studying this. There's so little information on this out there. There's next to nothing. 
Um, so, and we are so, I mean, all of you guys have been cranking and, and dropping so much awesome knowledge on the soil, and nobody knows anything about this on the, on the water end. You know, it's really, really amazing. You have a little bit from, from you know, uh, uh, waste processing and things like that, but that's about it. There isn't hardly any research on the, the food webs on the aquatic end, and it's really, really something that needs a lot more study in because it could be unlocking whole terpene profiles or, or plant resistances, we've noticed, PM resistance in aquaponics with split root zones is, is night and day. I can show you in a side-by-side -side all day long. I've dust both plants and one of them will get it and the other one won't. I mean, I'm sure you can probably you'll find something on it, but it won't you know, actually grow and, and become a problem. Um, it's really, really made a, a night and day difference in how I kind of approach things and look at the whole process. Um, go back, one, one second. Um, yeah, it, just, it was really, uh, so this is a picture of one of our R&D greenhouses from Colorado. You can see we have the pond underneath with the platform on it, above it. Um, and this acts as a thermal mass. This was a 4,000 gallon pond. And we heat this with solar water heaters uh, and that's where we're getting most of our heat mass. And even, even in the course of a night time, it's only going to drop two to four degrees, but put out a ton of heat into that greenhouse that we don't have to you know, provide at all. Um, if it gets too cold or too windy, you know, we have a couple of propane tanks on a closed loop water heater that provides you know, backup water heat uh, to make sure it doesn't get too cold. But this is a, this gives you an idea from you know, a, a top angle view of the water underneath. We had hatched walkways, uh, so we had access to the plumbing and everything. We weren't quite done putting the sides on and everything on that, but this is one of our R&D beds. Just wanted to show that. Oh, there's some, um, there's some cloth pot plots. We've had some problems with the cloth pot pots as well as the wicking beds with the plants so really close to flower over like the last two weeks. We've had, as the plant starts to finally die off, it kills off some of its leaves, kills off some of its roots, and when it's that much microbial activity, it, it didn't quite have it balanced out right. I think maybe if I hit it with a lot more labs, you might be able to get to work, or a little bit of more trichoderma, or, or something else to really over-dominate that pythium that we're bringing into at the very end. But um, We've also done a lot of fruit trees as well, if anyone has any questions on that. Um, so the role of your microbes is to break down the fish waste. Um, your microbes are going to be found throughout the system, but primarily in the water column and, and then in the, on the surfaces of your media beds. Um, actually, uh, R James Rokosi, and no one ever cites the study, found that 70% of your nitrifying bacteria actually live in the water column, which is directly against what most people tell you. Anyone that's ever done aquariums or, or ponds will tell you, you know, the opposite of that because it's just, it was just, you know, it was told wrong the first time. Um, uh, so again, the NASA study uh, did the, the biodiversity study, and uh, we got a chance to work with that over when I was working with Ouroboros Farms out in California. If you're looking for a really cool veggie farm to check out, they're based in Half Moon Bay. Um, they participated in that biodiversity study, and they were one of the ones. They were the reason why we had access to that data, which was really, really awesome on, on just comparing all those different grow methods. Um, they were vegetables, you know. There was no cannabis ones in that, but the soil food web applies just the same. Um, it also depends by region, you know. Uh, they also found that none of those aquaponic systems, even though that all those different, aqu they had, I think it was, was it 50, yeah, over 50 aquaponics farms they tested, none of them had the same aquatic food webs. They originally did the study to find out what are the key aquatic mi microbes we need for nitrogen, what are the key ones we need to bring with us to Mars for phosphorus, or if we leave Earth, what are the aquatic microbes that are important for this food web? And the answer is, this has co-evolved so many different times on Earth that there is no one answer. <laughs> Every single one of them was different across the country, which is amazing because even in soil you could find some of the same players playing the same roles in a lot of different ones. That's not the case with the aquatics, which again is really trippy considering you know how much we think we know about microbes. It kind of really blows open the whole back half of the of what we think we know. And again, our microbial health is going to keep your plants healthy. We talked about adding the labs, making the, not only the plants grow, but the fish grow. And that's why it's important if you just keep treating the microbes and you keep dosing your microbes and feeding them and keeping everything rocking in your system, the whole system is just going to kick ass on its own. It's going to generate its own nutrients, just like your soil beds will. If uh, all your microbes are dialed in, it's going to, it's going to run like a, a perfectly oiled clock and solve, you know, not all, but the vast majority of its own nutrient problems. Okay? So, everyone here is familiar with Mulder's chart? Is anyone not familiar with this? I can do the two minute thing on this. Okay, I'll do two minutes on Mulder's. So, anyone that's not familiar with Mulder's chart, this is a chart that if you ever have a weird deficiency, for instance, if you like lock out your zinc and your manganese in combination, that will prevent phosphorus uptake in your plant. And that will show, make your plant look purple. But if I, you can easily do this with a UV sterilizer in a closed hydroponic room. Super, super easy to replicate. You can do it all day long. Um, and it'll turn the plant purple. 
Well, you look at that and go, it has a phosphorus deficiency. Well, no, there's plenty of bioavailable phosphorus. You locked out the plant's ability to uptake it because you locked out two of the things it needed to make the enzyme it needed to do that, or you know whatever compound the plant needs. So this allows you to help say, okay, well, if I have too much iron, that can affect my uh, antagonistic with my copper or my phosphate or my zinc or my calcium. If I have um, uh, if I add a lot of iron, I might want to also add a little potassium and a little bit of manganese, uh, manganese because they're uh, synergetic. And if I raise one, I should raise the others to make to increase the availability of those. So, it, and there's much more complicated versions of this. There's ones with you know over 30 nutrients on it. it goes into the trace elements and everything else. But it gives you kind of a cheat sheet. But think of it more like a top. Okay, I want this thing to be balanced. And if I lean, if you get too much in one nutrient, that becomes unbalanced. And now, now it's tilted too much. And we want this to be level. When it's level, that's when the plants are going to grow the best. When everything's in the right ratios. This is why ratios oftentimes are a little bit more important than the exact PPM number. Because if stuff is out of ratio, it doesn't matter if your PPM number on one of the two is fine. It's going to completely prevent that from actually being uptaken and, and, and behave the right way. But your microbes work the same way. Think of it like this is protozoa, and this is rotifers, and this is uh, bacteria, and this is fungi, and this is, you know, blah, 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 blah. They're the exact same way. You need them to be in that balanced platform, just the same way that we want the nutrients to be that way. And people don't think of it that way. They're always like, I need to hit it with more fungi. I need to hit it with more mycorrhizae. No! You need the ratios to be right. You need to be balanced, just the way that we think of it this way. And a lot, and it, it's one of the easier ways that I've found to try to help get people to digest that kind of concept. Especially if you're familiar with Mulder's chart, it makes it really easy to, to, to get. Yeah. Anyone have any questions on that before we go back? Because that can be complicated. <laughs> yeah, it can be confusing at first, but when you have like uh, tissue sample data or, or water data and you're like, well, this doesn't make sense, you can, you can actually use it to decipher why it is that the plant is looking a certain way, even without tissue data, with just the water data, you can figure out, you know, oh, well, this is way out of whack. Um, so that's a lot. I just recently did a vegetable farm and the guy bought manganese instead of magnesium. And he'd been dosing manganese every day or every week for however long his manganese was over 240 parts per million. I couldn't actually get it to give me a proper reading to spike the whole thing. So that was pretty entertaining. <laughs> it's like, you gotta read these labels, man. So. <laughs> it's important. You got, um, my, uh, think of microbes like a food truck, okay? You got one guy in a food truck can do five people every five minutes. But if I take that same dude and I give him a whole restaurant with a sous chef, a prep chef, a hostess, a bunch of waiters, he can do 25, 30 people. Well, the chef is your nutrients and your plant, the customers are the plants and the, the staff is like your microbes. So it's a super easy way to understand, you know, why the role of microbes really changes the way, you know, hydroponics will be like a food truck where you're just kind of, Ch chuck in those nutrients at them and it's very inefficient and the restaurant would be like a really good soil food web and, and, and no-till or, or other methods you guys use or, or even an aquaponics system and it's a great way to kind of you know visually think about why it is that you need much lower nutrient levels in an aquaponic system compared to a soil system or not a soil system but even a, a hydroponic system why well, I can run with eight you know an eighth or a sixth of the nutrient levels and get exact same for, or better production Go ahead. So what we do with the fish waste, so we take our first pull of the fish waste, the heaviest stuff that goes to the worms, it's just a little bit too thick for us to use in the, in the brewers. Um, our second pull off of the, um, the radio flow filters, we'll put them to our, um, our new, um, uh, new mineralization tanks. So these are two mineralization tanks at a, a vegetable farm. Now for most of the cannabis guys, we just use the big vortex brewers. Um, they do a really good job as long as you don't put anything in that's too thick. And then what we'll do is, you guys see where the white pipe is there on the side? We fill the fish uh, with fish waste up to about here, and then we brew this for three to five days. When it has a big air blower on it, injects a ton of air in here, it's bubbling and churning and churning and churning, just like you would compost tea. Sometimes we'll add a microbial inoculants. I'm a really big fan of mammoth pea, or if, you're, you're, if you guys have a right, our other preferred um, phosphorus chelating microbe, um, that really helps unlock a lot more phosphorus and actually gets you almost to the point where you have to add very little phosphorus to the system at all because it really unlocks that last you know, 15 to 30 percent you need out of that fish waste to actually get to your target. Um, so it can be a great way to eliminate the need for, uh, or not completely eliminate, but almost completely eliminate the need for additional phosphorus. Um, but what we do is we shut off this system after three to five days, depending on how long we're going to brew it and why we're brewing it. 
We'll uh, let the fish waste settle to the bottom, and then we'll open up this valve and just take the heavy mineral-rich water off the top of this that's nice and clear and put it right back into the system. I can have a ton of really well-balanced nutrients that were generated by microbes from the system, from the fish waste. And there's nothing from there that came outside it unless I add any other microbial inoculants just to speed the process up. And, and put it right back into the system. And that's where we're getting most of our mineralization. Now we can also add lactobacillus to this. We could add um, FPJ, we could add um, uh, FHN, we could add whatever we want. Um, you know, if I needed to uh, up my calcium, I, know I could always add um, WCA actually. About to do a really nice video on that specifically around aquaponics. So um, and you can do all different kinds of things that you traditionally do with your, your you know, think of it almost like your compost tea in terms of what your inputs can possibly be. <laughs> Um, but that's how you're going to unlock and really maximize the nutrient availability of your micro of your fish potential. That's how we're able to actually get to proper production. Um, go ahead. Also lowers your nitrogen as well. So in commercial aquaponics, here's some of the early research and development they did with dual root zones of uh, Green Relief Incorporated. Uh, I did a bunch of work with them uh, on their nutrients, uh, you know, how to dial in their nutrients, what their dose, uh, their processes up there. So if anyone has any questions on commercial scale on there aren't too many other people that have <laughs> worked on a grow that's they're actually it's the biggest current grow so um, in aquaponics so if you guys have any questions let me know on that um again there's uh i have 14 aquaponic farms that have uh, cultivation licenses that are going up this year right now and that number is going up every day i just had to hire two people to help uh grow it so it's really expanding and taking off um, especially as these water restrictions and power restrictions and everything else are coming in, people are realizing this is the better climate, but especially for cold weather, this is going to get your, you know, especially for heating costs and everything else, this is going to get you to, to those numbers you need to be, especially when the prices of these pounds keep coming down. It gives you a lot better margin than the guy next door. Um, uh, oh, go back one. Back. Okay, this is a picture from uh, one of the R&D greenhouses. You can see these you know, massive, massive buds. We had really, really awesome. This is a, a Bruce Banner. And then, um, I'm trying to think, I thought there was one other thing on the far end of that picture, but it's a different one. Okay. Um, so we got media beds, DWCs, and wicking beds. Um, this is another picture from Green Relief Incorporated. They did an R&D of the DWC versus the media beds and some other stuff. Um, uh, and theirs, we did the same thing over at Aquaponics Source and our green beds way before they did. Um, you, in media beds, they don't have enough uh, nutrient input. Um, you also don't have any way to support a mycorrhizal fungi because there's no soil. Um, they really need that microbiome, um, and so we're going to provide that, and we'll talk about that. You have DWC, which lacks, you know, again, the ability to supplement a nutrient, and I'm locked into whatever the, the nutrients that fish can take. So I can't get the potassium high enough, I'll kill the fish. I'll give them a heart, heart issues. Um, so and if I want to get the nitrogen really high in veg, like super high, I can kill them that way with brown blood disease. So you got to be real careful. You know, I can't get those up to where they would be in hydro, so that's, that can't do that. So with wicking beds, we, I think you could, with a proper aerated soil mix, get production with, with um, wicking beds. You know, if someone's a better soil scientist than I am, uh, that could, could engineer a better aerated soil that would work better for that. I think you, there is potential. But again, I had problems really close to harvest for, for three runs and just got frustrated and said, I'm, I'm done wasting plants and wasting space in the greenhouse. Um, <laughs> and then dual root zone is the one we've settled on. Um, there's a gentleman out in um, Serbia that introduced it to me uh, at a conference. I was at an aquaponics who's growing cucumbers this way. And I went, holy crap, I'm going to try that on weed and see how that works. So, <laughs> so I did that and um, over the, I kind of developed that into a whole, uh, uh, a little bit different than what he was doing, but now, you know, much more extrapolated with that kind of concept and into something that works really well. Yeah. So the key to growing an aquaponics is something called dual root zone. So we have the top area where we have our terrestrial microbes and the bottom half where we have our aquatic microbes. And the bottom half floods and drains. So as the water floods and drains in here, um, it works like a diaphragm. So when the water goes down, it's bringing fresh air into this terrestrial soil microbe root zone that loves that fresh air. And then it, when it goes down, it's getting nice air into the, into the roots that want that air exposure briefly to get nice gas exchange like you would in an aeroponics or a hydroponics. And it comes back up and gives it nice nutrient-rich water in a short period of time and pushes that air that was in here up through the soil, giving nice new fresh air like a diaphragm. So this is constantly breathing like a lung, giving you really, really good gas exchange. And those microbes love it. They go crazy. So do the plants. Obviously, when your microbes are happy, your plants are happy. 
So uh, this gives you the most control. I can top feed, I can supplement, I can make a time release, very slow releasing soil layer where I don't have to add hardly anything the whole run if I want to. You know, you have lots of control with this. I can top feed. Um, so if you're trying to determine how much to water this, so if you're gonna water it from the top uh, to keep the soil wet, um, you're gonna take, say this, um, you could take this pot and sit it on the edge of your grow bed and take a, a known volume of water. So we'll say this whole thing will take 16 ounces of water. So it'll take 16, you know, two eight ounce glasses of water, pour it into the top of the soil and it'll start to come out the bottom of the pot. Well, that's, now I know I'm at saturation as soon as I can start to see that trickle. Well, cut that amount in half, okay? And then that's what you're gonna use to top feed from then on along with any other supplemental nutrients to maintain just the moisture layer in here. This bottom half, just from the humidity from down here, even if you're giving it a half inch or an inch layer, is perfectly fine. You're not gonna have any moisture issues in the bottom portion of this. But just keeping that top half moisturized and then supplemented with whatever you need to supplementally feed gives you a way to individually feed on a per plant basis um, and, and bypass any fish toxicity. You know, you could even use things that are not fish toxic if you decided to. Um, I don't know what, maybe like yucca extract or something. Um, uh, but without any, you know, affecting the main chemistry that would kill your fish. Um, so it's a great way and really the only way to do it. It also eliminates the need for decoupled systems, which is a lot of additional equipment. And if someone screws up with, with the flow rate, especially when they're cleaning and, 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 and cycling the waste between systems, I've seen three times where they've drained half the system or somebody set something wrong overnight with decoupled and stuff like that. So there's lots of different, you're just adding more failure points and we have enough crap to worry about. We have lots of things that us cannabis people have to worry about. So we, we just worry about the easy stuff. Um, so uh, next slide. So in a soil profile, you have your O horizon, your A horizon, your B horizon. Well, this is just what we're doing in those pots. We're just doing it in a potted way and adding a lot better gas exchange. Um, so you have the tail of two biomes. You got um, the, the aquaponics is five to ten percent of the water. Um, their highest cost after nutrients. Um, you know, you got all the water restrictions such as Humboldt, um, California, other states simply don't have enough water. Like realistically, to do the full water production for the West, we don't have enough water. So we're going to have to start doing things like hugo beds or no-till or aquaponics to get those water usages down and away from this big commercial guys that are just using entirely too much water and really you know, putting all of us in jeopardy. And the next time there's a big drought, who are they going to go after first? The vegetable growers or us? Of course they're going to go after us. Um, and then remember, you have multiple biomes, so you can, again, you're benefiting from both the aquatic and the soil. Okay. So, um, in the soil layer, you have your mycorrhizal networks, your terrestrial bacteria, you can supplement, you got your nematodes, your protozoa, um, you can, top, again, top feed, you can use your ferments. Um, and the soil layer just provides that, that biome for all those different things. And that really what we found, is especially growing lots of different crops in aquaponics, the woodier the crop and the more lignin, the more it seems to rely on fungi at least in aquaponics. So the deeper the soil layer it requires to get better, good, traditional equivalent to normal production in aquaponics. So if I'm doing fruit trees, I'm gonna do a dual root zone that's two thirds soil and one third media bed, or even a quarter media bed at the bottom, and have a lot deeper soil layer than I would with say a, um, and it'll still grow much faster even with just that small amount at the bottom than say a, a cannabis plant where I want maybe like a 50-50 or a 60-40. Um, you know, as far as maximum ratios for that. And then we just separate those two layers with a layer of burlap or the root pair mirror book cloth. And just to keep that soil from going down and wicking back up, the water back up. Next slide. Um, so there's the depth, you want about a half inch um, a layer uh, between the water and the, and the burlap. Um, this is a cabbage I grew in a dual root zone. You can see the excuse me, aquarium pharmaceutical uh, testing bottle, if you guys are familiar with those on that cabbage, just to give you an idea of size. Actually, won a thousand dollar scholarship for one of our coworkers' daughters with that cabbage. <laughs> she was the best compost tea maker, man. She made the best tea for those plants. <laughs> um, so this is an example of how the roots grow in an aquaponic system. You got your finer roots that end up growing up in the terrestrial zone, and you got your, your kind of more of a bare root, and then lots of fine roots again, almost like a hydroponic in the bottom. We're going to show you that in a second. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of how that whole whole thing breaks down. Um, go ahead, next slide. So here's an example of a side-by-side -side on the left there of tomatoes. Anyone that went to the um, uh, aquaponics fest um, got the chance to see those in person in the lab. We had the lab all set up for public tours and stuff. 
Um, and the, the tomato on the right had 44% more flowers after three months and 38% more fruit than the tomato on the left. And that was no additional supplements, just a, a compost, you know, a decent, comp pretty sterile compost. I think it was forest floor, or not forest floor, um, um, pro mix, just a straight pro mix with mycorrhizae with no nutrients in it. And um, on the right one, uh, and again, that was a 700 gallon system. And then here on the right is a, uh, a lemon tree we did. And a 55 gallon drum, it's a dual root zone as well, just scaled up, okay. So here's a side by side of those same plants, media bed versus just adding soil. So this is just adding a soil layer so that it has even a small amount of mycorrhizae. Night and day difference, that's not even comparable. <laughs> now that's why you're gonna get way better differences with, the, with the, even having a small amount of soil in an aquaponic system. But especially if you're doing more finicky crops, any crop that has a weird nutrient requirement, anything that's heavy fruiting or flowering, this is how you wanna do it in aquaponics and really the only way to do cannabis. Yeah? I just wanted to ask what kind of soil you so I'm currently using mostly compost from the fish waste. We cut that with some ProMix just because it's a little bit hot after, you know, after we generate it and let it sit for a bit. Um, but that seems to be the best, you know, the ProMix with mycorrhizae. As far as just cheap bulk, you know, for the, for most of these people, um, you could do better than that. But for, for most of these guys, they just want a cheap, you know, they want it right now. They want to buy this and set it up in three months and go, you know. Yeah. How established is your root zone in the soil before you introduce it to the media, or do you plug uh, your start right into that um, scenario? Sure, it's a great question. So what we'll do is I'll take my clones and I'll put them in little um, half gallon or, or, or quarter gallon pots, and we'll put them in soil, and we'll have them sit with like a, a low tray of water, like a, a just a, a real low constant flooded tray of water for uh, one to two weeks, just so we can pack them in together and, and really veg them out a little bit and get a little bit better structure on them, and then we'll put, put take those pop them right out and stick them right into the top half of the media bed, right to the burlap layer. And then they're just ready to rock in that main one. And then we leave them in there. What we'll do, uh, when, another thing that I'd like to do is, um, instead of having moving the plants from a veg room to a flowering room, we have the, all the beds plumbed so that I can switch it from the veg system to the flowering system on the plumbing, uh, in terms of what feeds the source of the beds and where they're draining back to. And then all I have to do is change the, you know, put the light depth on and they're good. I don't have to move anything. That saves a lot of labor hours. And a lot, you see a lot of people moving plants from bedrooms the flower rooms, if you have the option to just leave those plants there, that's a, that's a lot of hours, that's a one or two days worth of labor, that's a lot of money. You know, a lot of, especially on big commercial grows, people for, don't think about that kind of stuff. They're so used to doing it in their homes and their smaller grows and smaller scale, it's not worth it. And moving bugs around and everything else. You know, it's not, it's also about biosecurity, you know. By popping it right out, you mean like? Yeah, we'll a little pot, I'll just take the pot off and stick it, and stick it right in the, you know, with the soil okay. still on there, and stick it right into another pot that has soil just oh, okay. in it. Yep. So then these pots are obviously hot. I move them in from a quarter or half gallon pot bottom. to a to a seven, four or seven gallon. But at the bottom of the pot, there's no. Oh, uh, so we have uh, lot of basket bottoms. Right. Pot. Yep. Just or we drill extra like holes depending on how much, how big, if you're doing really big growth, just buy the basket bottoms. Yeah. Um, so there's a pepper we grafted on there. One of my coworkers asked me why I was taking the pepper, clone, pepper clones. So I grafted it on there and got it to live just long enough for the pepper to finish right before we harvest. You can see those little popcorn buds on it. It was right before harvest. But we got it to live on there long enough just to take a picture for a while and make it still be green. So she didn't think it was as funny as I did. <laughs> Go ahead. Have you played around with grafting any other, any other products? Or with, any other, like, plants to cannabis? It doesn't, this is the resin with cannabis kills pretty much it. I, we, we, I've put lots of different nightshades on it and stuff, primarily just because we have them around at the lab, but nothing ever stuck. Basil is the other one I think we tried. For fun, try right. hops, hops. Hops. Well, I've done hops in aquaponics. They come out super turkey, just exactly. like the cannabis does, actually. There's a, um, in Chicago somewhere, there's a, uh, uh, I built a whole grow out for them doing hops in a converted um, uh, firehouse. Really cool, yeah. Uh, next, oh, um, go back one. So you have your five controls with aquaponics. You can dose the water with nutrients up to what the fish can tolerate. You can dose the soil with whatever. Um, you can do the custom soil mixes. You can foliar your spray, and then you can do uh, various fish. I'll kind of speed up here a little bit. Yeah. So you got the dual root zone benefits. You've got a lot more control. You can increase nutrients both in your soil food web and aquatic food web. You can get all the benefits of your traditional soil food webs that you guys are already familiar with. Um, and, and apply all those things to your soil layer and you know, still get the benefit of the aquatic. 
Um, you have the ability to do different pHs in your soil and in your water. Um, just don't do more than 0.7 or 0.8 pH. You can run more acidic soil if you want to have more available um, nutrients up in that soil there, but don't push it more than 0.5 or 0.6 difference. The plant will not take it. Now that's max. It shouldn't normally be that much, but you can do that if you have to to, to bend the plants to what you're trying to do. Um, uh, again, you can do time release. It also helps with the immune system of plants. We talked about the powdery mildew. It seems to really affect the resistance when you have that split root zone. Um, I don't know why. I just know that I can repeat it over and over again. <laughs> I'm more than happy to tell you. I have no idea why, but I can tell you how to repeat it. <laughs> um, and then um, you can also do no-till. I know of two friends of mine now that have done three runs in a row where they just cut the stalk off and put the next plant in right next to the old one uh, with much larger pots doing this and no-till and it worked just fine. You know, I don't really know what the benefit would be because traditionally the benefit of no-till is that it's accumulating things from deeper and, and farther from where it is. So but with the, uh, the aquatic food web, I don't really need to do that because we're supplementing that with the, the mineralization. Um, but it, there may be a benefit to it. Um, next slide. Um, common issues for both of our industries and aquaponics is uh, pesticide concerns, regulatory overreach. Um, Funny enough, a lot of things from the cannabis industry is spilling over into aquaponics. You're seeing aquaponics farms being told they have to put light depth up because their lights are on at night, which is thirty to forty thousand dollars. Those guys do not have. You know, a lot of these guys are barely making a, a you know a profit. You know, each year, uh, not or not making a huge profit at the very least. So that's they they can't survive that kind of thing. So it is kind of I did a whole talk at the aquaponics industry on how this industry affects that one in terms of regulation and why they need to start thinking about it quick or they're going to get screwed like we did. Um, and lack of SOP standardization, that's also a problem with us. There's, there's very little about how to do things in, you know, actually in a, in a regenerative way, or in a, in a, in a, especially for aquaponics, you know, there's really nothing out there. Um, <laughs> uh, when I first started aquaponics, no one could tell me what the PPM range should be for lettuce or basil. We had to do all of that over five years with side-by-side -side tests with a whole bunch of different systems, and then working with the University of um, Charlie over at UBI, and, um, uh, got, uh, Dr. Brooks over at Arizona and, and um, the guys out in the University of Hawaii and aggregating all these different universities and actually figuring out, hey, what the heck is the actual proper nutrient range in aquaponics with microbial biodiversity for peppers or tomatoes? And then it was, okay, well, what is it for cannabis? So we did that for th just three years where we just dialed in and changed all different nutrient values and really screwed with the tissue, did a lot of tissue samples. I was paying, well, I was donating cannabis to someone uh, to do tissue samples for us before you can do cannabis tissue samples. So uh, it's really, really awesome to actually get tissue sample data. We, you know, this was back in 2014, 2015, way before it was you know, at all easy to get. Nowadays, you can just, you know, there's labs that'll do it for 30 bucks, but you couldn't do it at all then. Um, uh, and then managing labor costs, uh, local permitting issues, constantly changing regulations, and biosecurity are things that we both share in both of our industries. Um, you know, we, we have to worry about significantly. Like, yeah. uh, are there any major The fish, um, the biggest two, uh, the, the biggest cause of issues with fish is pH or temperature swing. You should have always a, 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 some type of heater so there's a minimum temperature at all times. Even if it's set, you know, five degrees or six degrees below whatever your normal temperature is, just so that if someone leaves a door open, um, if, if a roof blows open, um, someone breaks in, there's a, a, a guys in um, New Mexico that lost a whole greenhouse full of fish because a homeless guy broke in to steal the lights and broke in, stole all the lights, and cut a huge hole in it. It was like negative 10 that night, and it killed everything in the greenhouse. So you got, you know, I've seen really weird stuff. I had a, I was in a dentist's office, and the nitrous line was leaking through the drop ceiling and killing all the fish. Anything you put in there would die in 48 hours. We physically replaced the fish tank with new water, with a cycled fish tank from the store that was cycled for a month. Everything died within 24 hours, and I could not figure it out. So. I went, looked around, moved the ceiling tiles, and found there was a, a nick in the, in the nitrous line where this electrician had nicked the nitrous line, but it wasn't showing up high enough to do a pressure reading difference. It was real slow uh, on the gauge in the dentist office. So I've seen really weird problems with chemistry. So if you got something really off the wall, hit me with it, I might have seen it, or I might know someone that has. Um, next slide. Lactobacillus ferments. Um, these are really, really great. Again, uh, Joe Pate, uh, George Pate did the study down at the University of Kentucky State that showed not only does it make your fish grow faster by 15%, it makes your plants grow faster. So why wouldn't you use it? You got, you know, Chris could tell you all about how good it makes your plants grow, but 
uh, you know, it's really awesome to see it work for, with, uh, with fish as well. So it's really, really cool. And uh, definitely you can check out University of Kentucky State is doing a lot of really awesome aquaponic hemp research right now. Um, they can't do cannabis, but we can do hemp that, um, you know, is below THC threshold, which gives us a lot of leeway for terpene re research and other things. So, um, you know, gives us a lot of room to wiggle. At least for now. Um, that also, it's a great way. There's a study in 2016 uh, where they actually found that um, lactobacillus is better than bleach for cleaning meat processing facilities in terms of reducing pathogenic microbes. So um, it's a great, great thing. And you know, also think about using it for your your food processing areas to keep your areas clean of microbes. You know, we're all worried about uh, microbial testing. It could be a great back, you know, additional uh, cleaning process as well. Um, next slide. Um, so isolated plant enzymes. Um, this here is isolated phycocyanin. Um, phycocyanin, as you guys know, is the precursor for chlorophyll. When you spray this on the plants as a foliar with the right oxins, it really eats it up. And it loves it. And it will slam your bricks levels like you wouldn't believe. Um, so this is some of the cool stuff. I want you guys to think about especially um, microbial processes, you know, KNF. Um, you know, lactobacillus or, or fermented fruit juices or, or even activated compost teas. Think of them like a toolbox. Think of them like a, buying an air compressor. Now I can get all these cool pneumatic tools that I can use with it, do all these cool pneumatic things that I couldn't do before. Don't think of it as a singular formula. You know, experiment with it. Put different additives in it. You know, put, put moringa leaf in there. Put spirulina in there. Put, put azola in there. You know, break down all kinds of, of Put horsetail in there. You know, use these these microbes to unlock sources that you have around you to, to get different things you want. It won't always work great, but it will a lot of the time. And you might discover something really cool and really interesting. Um, so uh, I just wanted to kind of give you some of this is some of the different research I found. I've also done a lot of research with doing um, a similar process with fan leaves to increase um, a mold resistance. And we can uh, I couldn't tell you how what exactly is going on. I have a theory on what's going on based on the microbes involved, but. Um, it increases mold resistance, and we're make, generating it from the fan leaves and some water and a microbe. So there's all different kinds of cool things you can do by, by taking some of the other people that are speaking here and applying their methodologies and experimenting them with other inputs, and you'll end up with stuff like the phycocyanin and other really cool things that you know uh, you never would have figured out you'd be able to do in a, in a way that's not you know in a laboratory with a bunch of glassware, you know. Um, also, you can drink it, and it's good for your, uh, your your joints, too, so it's not just a plant food. Yeah. Um, other inoculants that I like to use for aquaponics, specifically Mammoth P and Recharge, are the two that I like to use for our mineralization. Um, full disclosure, I'm friends with Scotty at Recharge. Um, he's a good friend of mine. I was on episode 41 of their podcast as well, so, you know, if you want to call me biased or whatever, that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, the other one I use a lot with, uh, not so much cannabis producers, but a lot with lettuce producers is Root Guardian. Um, I use Root Guardian all the time to nuke uh, mold problems in DWC uh, lettuce setups. And it's really, really, really good for getting rid of botrytis and uh, uh, other like root rot type things in cannabis. Um, I don't know if I would use that with aquaponics because you upset everything else with the soil layer, but at least if you're doing DWC with lettuce, it's one of my best uh, whack-a-moles. Um, again, Mammoth Pea is if you're doing aquaponics, use mammoth pea or at least a similar phosphorus chelating microbe. It will just save you a lot of money and make a nightmare difference in your system. Um, and again, there's lots of other ones. If you have other microbial inoculants or you're making your own ino uh, microbial inoculants, put them in your system. You know, be a little bit mindful of what's going in there. Avoid yuck extract that will kill all your fish instantly. Um, but a, and a couple of other things, you know, just because it's organic or just because it's, you know, natural doesn't mean it won't kill fish. A lot of people seem to have that problem, especially with yucca, because they sell, often sell saponin as a, uh, a root in, uh, growth increaser. Um, is root growth increaser? Yeah, um, I, I don't use it ever. So, um, but yeah, so and people kill all their at least 18 times. I've gotten that phone call, so don't do that. Okay. Silica. Silica is another one. Um, I'm the prophet of silica and aquaponics. To my knowledge, I was the first person to do side-by-sides with different silica levels in a laboratory with aquaponics. Um, we did it with lettuce and basil and, and tomatoes the first time. Um, for, le for those, we want 60 parts per million and above. Um, for cannabis, we want 60 to 100 parts per million. Um, if you can boost it a little bit higher in flour, that's even better. But man, does it make a big difference in your disease resistance, particularly in molds. Um, you know, if your BPD is falling out of range at nighttime, it's getting a little bit too cold. 
If your silica's up there and your calcium's up there, that plant's still gonna have a good shot of resisting anything that comes in there, you know? But if it's not, um, the other big thing is there's been a couple of studies just in the last two years on um, the uh, importance of silica and gene expression specifically responsible for immune systems in plants and how if the silica isn't above a certain threshold, those genes don't express properly and you don't actually don't get as strong of a proper immune system. And nobody in aquaponics ever talks about silica. Um, to me, it's super simple to have because when I need to add pH up occasionally, I just add potassium silicate and I'm adding at least a slow passive amount of silica. Or I can add lactobacillus ferment with, with um, horsetail and get a whole bunch. Just be mindful of where you get your horsetail. Horsetail is a great bioaccumulator of heavy metals as well, so make sure you get it from a clean area. Don't get it next to the road where it's going to be full of cadmium or whatever people's, you know, uh, 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 or exhaust systems or you know downstream from a mine you're gonna get lots of heavy metals but if you can get a nice clean source from a pond near your house or something it's a great source of silica um, um, again potassium silicate for pH up or calcium silicate which isn't that bioavailable in water um, and then the silicon dioxide which is very low bioavailability the one I like to use especially for people that are trying to stay organically certified is Montana Grow um, the gentleman's a great, big fan of the cannabis community, he donates a lot of free stuff. He's, he's helped out a couple of events that I've helped on for different, you know, educational, promotional groups. And uh, he's a great guy, so um, uh, with a great product. Yeah. Um, oyster, uh, so this is when we did the oyster mushrooms down in uh, Longmont, uh, South Longmont. We actually built a whole oyster mushroom um, set up, and then we used this for CO2 for our plants. We were able to maintain 1,100 ppm's of CO2 by building a uh, mushroom greenhouse that was about 55% uh, of the size of the cannabis greenhouse. Um, if you're looking to really uh, get more uh, of a less carbon footprint for your CO2 production, this can be a great, great option. I have a friend of mine, his name is Nick Arnold. I can put you in touch with him if you're wanting to do this on a commercial scale or large scale. Um, he can tell you all the knickknacks and details, but I helped him with it. Uh, I was blessed enough. Underneath here is actually fish tanks. Um, this here is the top of the fish tank. So we had these growing, the humidity was coming up off the fish tanks. Um, extra mushrooms and stuff would fall down, the fish would eat them. Uh, the only downside is, is that because of the extra CO2, there's a lot more carbonic acid being generated. So you do have to supplement your DKH, your dissolved carbonate hardness, um, more frequently with this method. You're traditionally using potassium bi uh, bicarbonate, which you can get in an omni certified form if you need to. Um, they can also be a great way to generate profit off your CO2 generation. Instead of me buying CO2 tanks or burning fuel, I can actually you know, just pay one person and actually make a profit off of it. And I have more, more uh, we talked about earlier, and I know that uh, Josh and Kelly are gonna talk on this on biodiversity of your farm. You, know, you, you don't wanna just sell cannabis, you wanna sell vegetables and other things and try to get lots of different revenue streams, especially with the way the market's changing. Um, I know you guys have done lots of wonderful talks on that. And it can be a great way, again, to be not only that, but when you look at, when you go to people in your marketing, well, look how sustainable we are. You know, we're growing vegetables, we're growing mushrooms for SEO2, we grow cannabis, you know, you're building that whole holistic story to your farm and your, your production that really puts you at an edge over these big commercial producers. These people, they, they, their, their heart goes out to that, they want to, to buy from you. There's a whole market of people that want that and want that available to them, and that's, you really want to have that available, and that's why you should consider things like this, and, and why I love to involve people in this kind of off-the-wall side kind of stuff, because, you know, it's really cool to incorporate into other things, and this is an aquaponic mushroom setup incorporated into provide CO2, like, it's such a strange combination of things, but it works, you know, we were growing pe tons of peppers and tomatoes in the initial, and then we grow lots of weed in the second one. <laughs> I didn't want to go, we'd waste plant count in Colorado until we do the work. What's the substrate for the mushrooms? Um, those are on straw. Yeah, steamed straw. Um, the, the, there's lots of good mushroom channels on, um, uh, what's his name? Um, one particular, Paul Stanton's. Everybody knows him, but there's a guy that has uh, lots of how-to videos. I'll think of it for the end of the talk. Like, what was the guy he just got his channel banned or whatever recently, yeah, and he got his channel back. Um, what was the guy's name you said? Oh, Nick Arnold. Yeah, he's from Turtle Island Farms. Um, if you guys need to send contact info, shoot me an email. Um, um, so earthquake proofing is something else I want to touch on, especially being on the West Coast. Um, this is what we did down in Jamaica. You can see the big black tubing up there is our geothermal, which we didn't get to yet, but we'll talk about that next. And then you got the, the, the plumbing and the, the gravel. This keeps the gra uh, plumbing in the event of an earthquake, gives it room to shift around and keep it from breaking. Um, it allows the pipe to float around. If I had an earthquake and this was all clay, the pipe will snap. So if you're doing an earthquake area, 
This is required, or you're going to really regret having to dig up all your plumbing when the earthquake hits. I've had to do that already once in, in San Francisco. We had to, well, we just have a minor repair, but it would have been bad. Good. So this is a climate control. So this is the solar water heating I was talking about. These are solar water heaters off of a, a we just got, you know, off of a, someone throwing them away from when they were a fad in the 70s and 80s uh, in Boulder. We got these for free on Craigslist. Um, we set these up. These were, I think, 12 foot by uh, um, 4 foot, if memory serves me right. And these are vacuum. Uh, so uh, because it's in a vacuum, these can boil a lot, a lot lower temperature than you would otherwise. Um, so this is an uh, insulated pipe that goes underground into our, our uh, pond, which is underneath of this, which is in here. And then we have the uh, PEX line, you know, the yellow PEX you get at uh, Home Depot. Take the yellow plastic off of it, it's stainless steel, it's great. You can put it right down into the water, it won't oxidize, there's low, no zinc in it that's going to hurt your fish. Uh, and you can use that for a heat exchanger. Put that on close with a glycol, you put this on a thermal switch that turns on, and you got 180 degree water heating your pond the moment the sun comes out. It's awesome. And then at nighttime, okay, so say it's been 100 degrees out all day, 105, this, this water also sucks in a lot of heat as well in the greenhouse. So, but it can get too warm. So if this is constantly getting warmer every day because we have a, a heat wave, I can, and but at nighttime it's getting cold, it's at least getting colder than the water temperature, I can turn these on at night and these are now so, uh, heat radiators. So this will radiate heat off of the water, allowing me to drop the temperature two to four degrees at nighttime and allow it to absorb that heat again the next day. So you can use this both as heating and cooling, even though it looks just like a heating system. Um, again, this is part of the way that we were able to get such a low propane dump thing in the front range. Next one. Here's a setup on how you do a larger setup, just a you know real quick SketchUp version. But you have your water heating panels running to a central pond underneath. You put your platform on top. We actually built a platform. We cut up an old bus frame that we wrecked, and uh, we built it on a scaffolding platform so we could turn and adjust the feet so as it settled we could relevel it. it. Worked really well. You get it all for free. You know they have they can only use those scaffolding for so many years they got to replace it so. So here's our geothermal. Um, we dug a huge hole, I believe it was 10 feet down from the surface. Um, we went down three, there's three tubes worth. Uh, this actually goes a whole other layer down below when this picture was taken. Um, there's the, the uh, cloth over top of the bottom layer. Um, so this goes down here and then it goes in a V shape. So you'll have one set of tubes here and another set of PVC um, tank, you know, 55 gallon drums here and here and the other corners. And this is going to have your, your aeration tubes. Now, what's important is, is that your tubes from here to your outputs are equal length. If they're not equal length, you won't get equal airflow. You see companies out there that have grid squares, nice, neat grids with the intake on each end. They get horrible airflow. The sensor gets really great airflow, and the far ends end up building mold and where your rats live, which is you do not want in a greenhouse. I've seen it happen. We've run side by side with the V shape versus the square, and the V shape was over five degrees warmer. Uh, in the summertime or in the wintertime, and, and uh, I forget how many degrees in the in the summer uh, for the cooling. I, I forget. Ask me, I can send you the thing. Um, but what's important is is that these are the same length, and as long as these are the same length, you're good. So what you want to do is you want to connect these, and then put a layer of gravel or other or you know or soil or whatever, preferably gravel, and then you're going to layer those over and over again by connecting them together. It make a lot more sense when you see the next diagram. Um, and then you're going to put your top layer on before you put your casing layer on. So it's going to look like this when it's all done. So you have your tubes that are connecting each one, and then your intake is up here. So we have a little solar powered fan here, a little 100 watt fan. This blows air down. It's just running on a solar panel. This runs during the day. Um, we can also set it up on a thermal switch, whatever you want to do. Blows the air down underground, uh, across to the outputs, and back up top. It's called a GAT or ground air thermal exchange. To me, this should be legally required for all greenhouse construction. It saves so much money in climate control costs by both heating and cooling it. It should be required just to save money, like the power grid. Um, this, in the summertime, works as an air conditioner. You can put out, you know, ten. Remember, the ground is constantly 58 to 60 degrees, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, if you're up here, it's probably a little bit colder. Um, so you're going to constantly get, you know, 58, 60 degree air from the ground just by this tiny little fan taking the hottest air from your greenhouse and cooling it back down. So we can keep that temperature range really even. Now if it gets super cold, I'm still pulling 58 to 60 degree air out of there. So I only have to heat from there back up to what I want to. So again, it's keeping that temperature balanced and keeping it from going like this, which is what kills plants and fish. Which is, 
Then you have a backup heating system. Yeah, so the backup to that, uh, go back two slides. Oh, one more. One more. Sorry. So uh, with this, with the heat exchanger, the, the, it connects to this. We have a second one that's on a tankless water heater. That's the same kind of coil. Instead, of basically, the tankless water heater replaces this. And that's the only propane we use for heating. And again, it just heated the water base. Now, if I was doing soil for you guys that already have greenhouses, you can get 55-gallon drums and just cap them and plumb them together in, in a row and then stack the next one into a row. Instead of having a pond in the bottom, you can just do a wall on your north wall with black, black drums and, and plumb them through. And it'll give you not, not exactly the same, but it'll put out a lot of heat and save you a lot of money. Like equal, maybe not quite to the same extent, you just, it would be worth the money spent for sure. Uh, and really, really reduce your heating and, and cooling bills. Yeah, we'll go. Okay, so easy VPD with aquaponics. Um, last year, I didn't hear anybody at this conference talk about VPD, so I thought I'd talk about it for two minutes. Um, does everyone here know what VPD is? Who here doesn't know what VPD is? Okay, so vapor pressure deficit is the difference between the, uh, what the air can hold and, uh, and moisture, and then what the, uh, what the moist, uh, air can hold the moisture at, at saturation. So um, if this gets too high, it's gonna cause condensation in your room. Um, this also can cause mold outbreaks. So you guys ever see when the temperature is like a little bit lower in the morning and it's kind of humid, and then that greenhouse heats up to like 85, 88, and all of a sudden those plants start praying right away? Like, you know what I'm talking about? And they all stand up to attention. Okay, that's because the DPD got dialed in, now they can properly respirate at their maximum rate. Um, the proper range for cannabis is 85 to 88 degrees Fahrenheit at 75% humidity, which is way higher than what most people traditionally will tell you, but if you put your plants that way, they will grow faster than you've ever seen them grow before. That gets those stomata, it's the perfect range for those stomata and the, the right pressures and the right humidity, and those plants crank. And the same thing, you can lower that, lower the temperature, but you also gotta or lower the humidity as well. You gotta keep it in that zone, which is, hit me with the next slide for me. So that orange range, and again, this picture isn't mine, and I'll take no credit for it, but this is the range you wanna keep your BPD in. Now, if you're at optimal leaf surface temperature, remember, leaf surface temperature what matters for BPD, not air surface temperature. The leaf surface is what's respirating, not the air. Um, uh, so you want 86 to 88 degrees Fahrenheit at 80% humidity, 75-80%. That's what's going to get you the best, you know, the best growth, and you will not have fungal problems with that as long as you have air movement. That's the third part of BPD that no one talks about. This only applies if you have good air movement through your canopy. That is the third component of it, and people never talk about that when they talk about BPD. I just like to add on what I've noticed with all the pressure deficit keeping it Oh yeah, and when it stayed in this range, I've never had mold problems. The plants just, their immune systems at that peak thing, and it doesn't have it. Now, I will absolutely have problems if I drop the temperature. If it's at 80% and my temps go down to 68 at night, that's bad. That's real bad. So you gotta have your dehumidifier on at night just to bring that down. But with aquaponics, we're always sitting 70% you know, plus minus uh, humidity to start off with. So you know, 70, 80, or maybe a little up towards closer to the day. So you don't even have to pay attention to humidifiers. You're just running the dehumidifier, which is one less thing you gotta pay hourly for on electricity. So it, again, it saves you on cost and makes it dialed in to get that maximum growth rate of plants simply by the way that we're doing it with the whole methodology. You know, it, it gets you there automatically. But yeah, it's just something I wanted to touch on because I didn't hear anybody last year. Yeah. Jack, and those numbers relate just to cannabis? Or is yeah, so other crops would be a slightly different temperature range. Lettuce would be a little bit colder. Um, uh, but this is a good general middle of the road. This might be someone here that can answer that better than I could. Maybe not. Okay. My understanding is you just keep working down the temperature of the chain. Yeah. Yeah, you know, cannabis loves to be hot. I've had grown plants 105 out in the desert, uh, out east of San Diego, and as long as we get them tons of water and high humidity in, in the in the house in the greenhouse, no problem. Like no problem at all. Not even foxtailing. You know, they just grew faster. They maybe stretched a little bit, but not that bad. Okay. 
So equipment to avoid UV sterilizers, they crash your boron, your manganese, and your iron. Does anyone know how quickly a UV sterilizer will drop your iron out? Is that water? According to Dr. Dr. Resch, in water. One day. To drop all the bioavailable. What happens is it'll break the chelate, and the chelate, the iron that it changes to, builds up on the crystal sleeve of your UV sterilizer, and it makes this nice little thin iron shield that blocks all UV light from hitting that water, so it doesn't work anymore. People use them, though. People recommend them a lot for aquaponics. Um, but it, and again, it hamstrings your nutrients as well until it stops working. Um, auto feeders, they clog, and they're not reliable. Remember, if 85% of your input's there, why would you automate that? You wouldn't. Not for something that takes 15, you know, 15, 30 seconds a day to feed your fish. And if my fish don't respond, oh, there might be a water chemistry problem. Maybe the heater's not working. Something's wrong. If those fish, and I feed them, and they feed every day, and they don't hit the surface like piranhas, something's wrong with the system. That means I need to now do more investigating. A robot's not going to tell me that. You know what I mean? A human will, and it's such a low labor time, the amount of information I can get that can be critical to the survival of that system is not worth the labor time saved by that. And it's something I would argue with lots of people on. It is not worth it, because I've seen plenty of people lose batches of fish or have, you know, be behind growth schedule because of failed, you know, feeders that they just were filling up every two weeks and ignoring, you know? So, um, sulfur burners, again, um, uh, You'll probably hear this later tonight, but sulfur burners will, will screw with your trichomes. Um, they'll stay in the resin and you can't really get it out. You can't purge it out. It just don't ever use them. You'll hear sometimes people at grocery stores will still tell you to use them. Don't use them. Um, they'll also kill your fish. Um, and then uh, yucca extract uh, will kill your fish instantly. Um, they used to press yucca. Uh, uh, you guys probably know if you're northern, not from up here, but they press the uh, yucca root and they get the safe in the Native Americans and they pour it into the streams to kill the fish and the, the tribe would wake down the stream and they just get the fish off the surface. Um, especially, you know, they do that once in a while during the, the fish runs. Um, and then just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe. Again, when I cut the yucca, um, you know, it, don't do it. And then water spinners. I get these guys, I don't know where they come from, you know, these weird ionized waters or the water that changes the frequency, harmony of whatever, and it's just a pipe with another piece of metal twisted in it and jammed in there with a piece of pliers or something. Um, people end up claiming it balances pH. Avoid all that hokey bogey bullshit. Like, look if it's look on scholar.google.com, and if you can't find anything, it's probably bullshit. Um, <laughs> and then MDBRs, um, they're great for aquaculture when you have no media bed surfaces or no microbial surfaces um, for bacteria to grow. But if you're doing cannabis and you're growing lots of root mass and lots of you know media beds and and that the the, the hydrogen media and stuff like that. Um, there's absolutely no reason to use an MEBR. You have hundreds of thousands of times more surface area in the rest of your row than you do on that. You're adding, what, 0.001% surface area? You're just wasting money. It doesn't do anything. Um, they also create a fine silt that gets all over everything. You can actually clog root pores. So I advise against them, even though you see some other aquaponic people lo love them. Next slide. Um, things to consider, moms, clones, uh, cloning operations, nurseries. Um, really is the best uh, application for this. Um, you know, you can get wonderful flowering crop, just the same, but it really does excel in, in vegetative growth. You, you will not get faster vegetative growth anywhere, uh, especially with proper structure. Um, increase certain cannabinoids in early testing. Again, THCV and CBD, um, we've been able to keep, increase those pretty regularly. Um, we've figured out exactly one of the mechanisms of the THCV, which is very cool. I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday on that. Um, but uh, there's some really cool things that we've kind of stumbled upon result, as a result of some just funky accidents that happened with malfunctioning hardware um, that resulted in a few things that ended up us discovering some cool things with THCV in particular. But um, increased mold resistance, uh, you know, much lower overhead cost. Fish food is a lot cheaper than supplemental nutrients or even, you know, soil nutrients can be much cheaper um, uh, or, for, than fish food. Or fish food is much cheaper than both. And then. It reduces your, your climate you know, climate control costs as well as your carbon footprint, you know. Uh, with aquaponics, we don't have to really rely on a whole lot of additional outputs. And very few, just iron and pH is the only thing we're really doing. A little bit of micronutrients now and then just to keep the system balanced. But we're made, most of our people are testing their water every two to four weeks, looking at the exact PPMs and making very minor adjustments, you know. Anywhere from one to, to 15 PPMs if we're going to dose, just like Elaine was saying. 
most of the time you do not need very much additional nutrient supplement. You just got to make a minor little adjustment. If it's way out of whack, maybe I need to fix it just for these next couple of weeks until this has time to finally get back to the right cycle and the right balance. But you know, you don't need anything real big with what we're doing. It's just very minor, just to keep that in the right ranges. And again, we do a lot more testing though. Most people that are doing testing, you guys aren't soil testing every two to four weeks. You know, we're testing that all the time and 40 bucks a test per system. So it can be a little slightly pricey, but you can dial it in and get your inputs to be super low. So, and thanks a lot. Uh, if you guys have any questions about aquaponics, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I have a podcast every week called Growing With Fishes. Um, we like to, we've had a lot of the different uh, speakers here uh, on the podcast um, and dropping their knowledge and uh, um, also have a, you know, Aquaponic Cannabis Facebook growers on Facebook and then um, you know, some other sources if you're looking for audio versions of the podcast. So thanks a lot. Um, if you guys have any other questions, um, I have no idea where we're at on time. Okay. We have a couple of questions real quick. If, you, if somebody wants to leave early, they can. Yeah. Probably come back with questions tomorrow. Okay. What are these little tricks that you found from a little bit more THC expression, or I mean THCV expression? Haven't patented those yet. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not ready to share those yet. So. Okay. <laughs> were those in strains that were already expressing the, the same some level? And it was just yeah, like, they weren't generating. These were ones that at least had some THC bit in previous testing. Yeah. And were we talking like larger or like how statistically? Uh, the lowest percent percent difference. Compared to the control mm. on the low end, and was that in proportion to the total cannabinoid difference between the two? Just the THC percentages. But that's I mean, were the were the proportions of total cannabinoids produced also seventeen percent higher? Or was it I don't remember to be honest with you. I have to go back and look at it. I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Uh, any other questions? Okay. And those were not just veg and aquaponics. Full full cycle. Veg and flour. Every every number I gave you was for veg and flour. There's nothing that I did split split at all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're all excited about the potential of increased cannabinoids and everything. Yep. But you mentioned that this is something you've done with food as well. Yep. Have you noticed anything when it comes to do, like international units of nutrients that's provided in in like the same way to like a tomato? So it's a great question. So we did a lot of side by sides with soil, particularly with tomatoes, because they have a very different profile. At least when we first started with the aquaponics, they were a lot more didn't have a lot of flavor. We were yeah. okay. You know what we found was the nutrient differences when we did uh, aquaponics versus soil. What chloride and silica. That's what got us down the rabbit hole with silica the first time. It also got me to stop dosing so much de uh, dechlorinated. I was leaving more chlorine in the system from this when we just top it off because our chloride levels were too low. And, and as soon as we boosted those two, man, did that make, at least in the aquatic layer. I have no idea what the soil layer is, but in the aquatic layer I can speak on, um, that made a night and day flavor difference. Night and day. So you're saying that it, it shows lower silicon chloride in an aquaponic system? Well, before we started, before we supplemented yeah. those, yeah. So That's actually what got us on the silica supplementation was that exact discovery. Cool. So now you're kind of coming to that normalization because of added silica. Exactly. And, and, you know, and the whole thing is you replace it first and then you go, okay, well, what microbial inputs can we use to replace that? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of the, cool. the, the chain. <laughs> Any other questions? Good. The one, people who work on the water sure, I would, and this is something I, I really rave and I'm a big passionate believer on. One person does all the dosing, one other person is there in case he gets sick or hit by a car. That knows how to do it. That's it. And maybe like the owner of the farm or whatever. But you get too many cooks in the kitchen, stuff gets overdosed or it doesn't get dosed. I've watched it happen with reef tanks and saltwater aquariums and stuff and watch people kill $10,000 of fish in 15 seconds. Yeah. So um, don't don't do that. You got one king in the castle unless he's not there, and he, you know that's predetermined or you know pre-communicated that this other person's in charge. No one else is allowed to dose. Again, there's too much. You know it's, that's your whole shebang, and that goes south. Your whole system south. You know. So having one master of the kingdom, you know, one farm manager that oversees everything, and that you know the owner can wring their neck on. If something goes wrong, that's what you want, you know, and then the underlings under them. No, you know, I, I can't, I'm so passionate about that. I had to, I was jumping, pulling my hair out, trying to tell that to a, a, a guy with a 100,000 gallon uh, vegetable system the other day. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you all. And uh, if you guys have any other questions afterwards, feel free to talk to me. So um, I didn't talk about this earlier, but uh, we kind of laid this out into three parts, right? Three days. Today we talked about the root zone for the most part. We kind of finished off with this little, we turned the corner and added the uh, aquatic ecosystem. But tomorrow we're, we're totally turning directions and we're going biostimulants. We're going to talk about the plants. Chris Trump is going to start us off in the morning. He's definitely going to talk about some root zone stuff. So I'm not trying to, you know, ban him in, but that's kind of how we thought about it the progression, um, and then we're going to have Dr. Faust, he's not going to be here unfortunately, he just got sick, but we're going to beam him in, so he'll virtually, virtually be here on the screen, um, and we'll try to get some questions and stuff. Um, and oh yeah, Josh and Kelly will be uh, in there in a minute, I don't know if I forget them, but um, they're going to talk, you know, the total regenerative package, and, you know, you haven't heard them, but they, they kind of bring the whole thing together. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going with uh, Suzanne Wainwright, who is IPM. Uh, bug specialist. So, and the next day we're going all genetics. We're flipping gears again, and it's like I'm really excited, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Um, your your genetic knowledge is uh, we're trying to chop it up. Um, so yeah, guys, let's have a let's have a break, and then we'll come back and talk um, trichomes and eddies with uh, Marcus Pisu Bahuman. So have a good lunch, guys. Or dinner. All right, good to hear that. Next, please. Thank you. 